Good evening, uh, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I have just been given permission to start uh, by Professor Potsma. And I think um, <coughs> I shall take uh, advantage uh, of that permission. Let me start by introducing myself. Uh, my name <coughs> is Niko Maluleke. I am the, one of the deputy vice chancellors here at the University of Johannesburg. I am responsible for internationalization, among other things. I have three jobs uh, in one. Um, and it is my real warm and great pleasure to see all of you and to welcome you to <coughs> the University of Johannesburg. I speak on behalf of the principal and vice chancellor, uh, Professor Iron Ransbeck, who, uh, when he heard I was coming here to say a few words of welcome at the beginning, uh, asked me to make sure that I do it in his name because he would have loved uh, uh, to be here <coughs> himself. I also speak on behalf of um, all our 48,000 students, all our staff and, and faculties, but especially the <coughs> Faculty of Education, uh, which is uh, headed by Professor Sarki Gravet, uh, sitting there and smiling kindly. Uh, on, on behalf of all of them, I really want to, uh, to welcome you here. I have been asked to to uh, make special mention and notice of uh, the following people in our midst. Uh, I've already uh, mentioned Professor Gravett. Um, I haven't seen other executive deans uh, from this university. <coughs> uh, as soon as they come, uh, you know, they say uh, all protocol observed. But I will say I'll protocol them when I observe them. Um, I also see uh, in our midst my good friend, Naim Dolly, uh, who uh, once invaded my office at UNISA. And the rest is history. And this is part of the history. Uh, thank you very much. I note that in our midst, there's also Mr. Shahid Vauda, uh, one of the contributors, I believe, to the uh, education has changed uh, uh, number that, that has just uh, come out. There is also someone from Taylor and Francis, um, Mariette Anslin, see here? Welcome. Uh, and also Mr. <coughs> Andrew Joseph from UNISA Press. I assume that the two of you are partners in this crime. Welcome uh, to the University of Johannesburg uh, and to this lecture in particular. As a young student in rural Limpopo, uh, when I started school, we were made to recite a poem in Chitsonga, which is my language. And the title of that poem was Jonzo Ailumi, which means education will not bite you. It was intended to encourage us to <coughs> go to school. But there was something a little terrorizing about that poem, as I recall it, uh, for me as a, as a young toddler. Because I couldn't disentangle the association between biting and education. Uh, because I wondered if education might actually bite one. And so when I saw the, the title of uh, this special issue, uh, being Education as Change, I was quite gratified because I thought, here is a notion of education that is slightly less terrorizing than the one I grew up with. Because education can bite. I think those of us sitting here will know that uh, it is possible to get beaten by education. Uh, beaten in a positive sense, but also in a negative sense. Um, 
and so I, I was quite, um, quite happy to, to see this and to, to be able to say a few words at the beginning of this uh, important lecture. Uh, last week, I was lucky enough to participate uh, in a panel discussion, in fact, as, as the respondent at a commemorative lecture of Steve Biko at the University of South Africa, which was given by um, Peter Jones. Uh, uh, many of you will know Peter Jones. And uh, I, I wondered whether it was a coincidence that this day comes so close uh, to that event, where another uh, seminal thinker of our country uh, was remembered and his thought and his work, uh, not merely his work in terms of writings, but his work as an activist, as a thinker, who was also an activist, an activist who was also a thinker. And, and I thought that um, it is a very pleasant uh, coincidence for these uh, two things uh, to be happening uh, at the same time. Few intellectuals that I know are as honest or so honest that they, they suffer for their intellectual honesty as uh, Neville Alexander did. And the University of Johannesburg is, is honored that uh, this, the first annual Neville Alexander commemorative lecture takes place here uh, at this time. With these few words, I want to welcome you to the University of Johannesburg for this, our first annual Neville Alexander commemorative lecture. We could not have chosen a more qualified and more appropriate speaker than Professor Crane Sudin, uh, who will be our guest speaker. And I'm looking forward, just as you are, to listening to his lecture. Thank you very much and welcome. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you, colleagues, and um, <clears throat> a particular thanks to the Faculty of Education for asking me to uh, be here on this occasion of this memorial to the life of Neville Alexander. I'd like to thank the university uh, for its thoughtfulness, its presence of mind, and particularly its foresight in organizing this lecture in honor of one of the country's most important uh, um, but somewhat neglected uh, public figures. <clears throat> We've gathered on many occasions in the last year in Neville Alexander's honor. There have been memorial talks, symposia, and conferences organized in his memory particularly in the two countries uh, with which he is most closely associated, South Africa and Germany. <clears throat> Extraordinary about these occasions, and I'll refer to important insights from those uh, at which I've been fortunate to be present. Extra extraordinary about them has been the wide range of Alexander's contributions to the country especially to questions of social difference, to language, and critically to the questions of equality and inequality. Many of us who've been in these gatherings have gone away surprised to hear things that we didn't know about him. It's not this breadth of interest and his involvement on which I will speak tonight on to talk about how he comes to provide us with a very particular <coughs> model of what it means to be a scholar in a time and place such as ours. And I want to try and show what this means for those of us who work in the academy. So I'm going to make the argument uh, that Neville not only represents, you must forgive me for talking in the present tense, it's really hard to uh, talk as if he's gone. I'll make the argument that he not only represents the best qualities 
one would wish to see in a scholar anywhere, but that he did so, and this is going to be the theme of what I'm going to be talking about, fully conscious of himself. Fully conscious of our common and divided histories in the country. And fully conscious of all the potential and hazards that lay in wait uh, in our futures as South Africans. I'm going to argue <coughs> that he brought a very particular understanding of what it means to be learned or educated. I'm going to say that <coughs> about him, there was a refusal to separate in this way in which I think we're encouraged to think in the academy, in this Cartesian way of dividing feeling and thinking. I'm going to be making the argument there that he tried to make his whole life about feeling, but feeling in a thinking way. But I'm getting ahead of myself, and so let me remind us all uh, what his life's timeline was. I don't describe this timeline to give you the authoritative story about Neville or to capture who he was, because, and those of us who've been around him will know that a kind of linearity of dates and events doesn't begin to provide us the space to explore the fullness of the commitment to openness. And openness is a word I'm going to be using frequently this evening. Uh, the openness, this desire to experiment and to explore life that Alexander deliberately sought to create for himself. Like Mr. Mandela, with whom Alexander had a complex relationship and to which uh, I will refer, it is difficult to encompass fully and wholly the scope of what his life was all about. But uh, for fullness of uh, the narration, it's important to remember that he was a Craddock boy, born on the 22nd of October in 1936. His father uh, was David James Alexander, a carpenter with whom he had a really complicated relationship. His mother was a woman called Mbiti Bishoch, and she was a school teacher, and he loved her absolutely dearly. He came to discover, uh, and it was an extraordinary thing that uh, all of us were really surprised by. Uh, it was a surprise to him too. He came to discover that his maternal grandmother was one of 64 Oromo slaves who were brought here in 1888. It's an extraordinary story, uh, one which is only now being uh, fully uh, surfaced. And these slaves were brought to Lovedale in the Eastern Cape. Uh, and um, it's extraordinary how little of the substance of this woman's life uh, even Neville uh, didn't know about until only late uh, in his life. His maternal grandfather was a Presbyterian church pastor. He grew up in Craddock and went to school at the Holy Rosary Convent, where he matriculated at the age of 16. He then went to the University of Cape Town, a very young man, to study German, graduating with high honours for his BA in 1955, a BA honours in 1956, and an MA in 1957. In 1958, he was awarded an Alexander von Humboldt Foundation scholarship to study for a PhD at the University of Tübingen in Germany, and he completed this degree in 1961. It's important for us to know also that uh, a Humboldt uh, fellowship has been created in Neville's honor and was uh, announced last year. He also completed a BA honors degree in history by correspondence in 1971 during his, in during his imprisonment uh, on Robben Island. When Alexander returned to South Africa in 1961, he taught at Livingston High School in Cape Town 
and resumed his work in socialist political organizations. He was instrumental in the formation of a study group in 1962, and this leaflet here has a, uh, a much fuller history than I'm telling you now. He was instrumental in the formation of a study group in 1962 known as the Yuchi Chan Club, which became the National Liberation Front. None of this has ever reached the pages of uh, any uh, really interesting historical journal. Uh, for doing this, he was expelled from the unity movement. He was arrested then also in July 1963, along with a number of NLF members, and convicted in 1964 of conspiracy to commit sabotage. He was jailed on Robben Island from 1964 to 1974, alongside of Nelson Mandela, Walter Sisulu, and a number of the country's most important political activists. Uh, when he was released in 1974, he was immediately placed uh, uh, under banning orders uh, and uh, house arrest in Lotus River, Cape Town, until 1979. At the end of his banning period, he openly took up streams of work that he had remained involved with even during his banning period. Two were absolutely crucial. The first was with building a united front of the organizations working among the politically disenfranchised and the working class which brought him into an important conversation with the leaders of the Black Consciousness Movement. And when I come to the end of this talk, I'll be saying something about his relationship with Steve Beaker. The second uh, was in education. With respect to the first, he came to play a formative role in the establishment of the Disorderly Bills Action Committee in the Western Cape and its successor, the Cape Action League, which itself was instrumental in the establishment of the National Forum, a coalition of left-wing organizations established uh, on the principles of a united front. After 1994, uh, with the reconciliation talks of, at Cadessa between the African National Congress and the National Party, he was in the forefront of the establishment of the workers' organization uh, for a socialist uh, Azania, Warza. On the education front, uh, Alexander was brought in by colleagues at the South African Committee for Higher Education, SACED, to run its Western Cape office. Out of this, he came to play one of the leading roles in establishing uh, Kanya College, an important precursor to all, and this is really important for us to know, all the academic development, prog development programs we have in the country to today, in some ways, owe its formation to uh, this work that was done uh, at, uh, at, at, at Kanya College. He also went on to establish the most important language initiatives in the country. Amongst them, the National Language Project and the Project for the Study of Alternative Education in South Africa, PRISA, very well known, located at the University of Cape Town. Less well known was the fact that it was Neville who championed the idea of alternative education and who came to give the student uprising of the 1970s and the 1980s much of its conceptual substance. When students uh, were beginning to boycott classes, he was, he was instrumental, and this was largely through SACED, in developing uh, uh, programs, classes, uh, curricular materials, uh, which became the foundation on which the people's education movement uh, uh, was elaborated. Through the NLP and PRICER, Alexander led the national debate around language policy and planning in South Africa. It was a, as a consequence of this uh, that he came to play a leading role in language policy development with various government department, departments, including serving for a period as the chairperson of the new government's language plan task group. His most recent work focused on the tension between multilingualism and the hegemony of English in the public sphere. Now, impressive as this narrative is by itself, does not do his courageousness justice. It does not show how this man came to be an embodiment alongside of, I mean, important ways in contrast to Mr. Mandela himself. The embodiment of what it means to be first and only and always a human being in South Africa. Not a hyphenated human being, male, female, gendered, white, black, raced, 
but a human being. And in what is going to come, uh, what follows, I try to show how his life came to provide an example of a revolution that was already embodied. Not one which was to come. And certainly not, as Paolo Jordan uh, was to accuse Alexander at a recent conference, of one who was waiting. He accused Alexander of waiting, as he said, for October. He's referring, of course, to the uh, October, Russian October Revolution. Now, those who knew Neville knew that October was always with him. His whole life was about actively finding ways to realize and give expression to October. It fermented and bubbled uh, always inside of him. October, however, was never, and this is important to be clear for understanding who this person never was, in which Jordan, Paolo Jordan, somehow misrecognized, uh, misrecognized. October was never a fully formed, a complete idea in his head. It was something that needed constant thinking about and experimenting with. He was entirely open about this October. And the complete opposite of a dogmatist about where this October would be going. He was fully conscious that his own life was an experiment about October. In this, he understood how much he himself was an ontological experiment. He gave himself to this experiment without reservation. How he gets to this experiment, how he gets to this commitment, is deeply important for thinking what it means to be a scholar in South Africa today. So Alexander is best known for his pol political work and scholarly achievements on the national question, the struggle for a democratic, non-racial, and anti-capitalist South Africa. His work on the role of language in the process of building national unity is particularly significant. He comes to an awareness of the importance of, and indeed the difficulty of these commitments through an early realization, and this is important for what I'm trying to say here, through an early realization of how history shapes the everyday, of how, in more sociological terms, people come to be the subject's dominant history wishes them to be. He understands how powerfully what people have in their heads is what history wants them to be. He makes a point to argue repeatedly that people are not born with these ideas which tell them who they are, which tell them that they are inferior, whether as women, as raced people, as bearers of language, as holders of class positions. He would repeatedly in his life invoke the biblical aphorism and tenet of the Cape African Teachers Association and I quote, and he would say this repeatedly, where there is no vision, the people perish. They couldn't, they could, no more should, therefore learn that they had in their compass, simply because they were human, the ability to learn to be that which they wish to be. And he wished for himself, as he wished for others, that this dominant narrative of life, whether that nar narrative was and however it was brought to bear on one would not be that which would in the end be the defining motor of one's life. He believed that each person had in, or in him or herself the capacity to exceed and to break the cages of the histories that supposedly defined who or she was. So how, how does he come to this commitment? How does he come to this trajectory for himself? Now, Alexander received his first lessons in life from his Catholic uh, nun teachers at school, who helped him understand that you, Neville, are a person with ability. But it was when he came to the University of Cape Town uh, in 1955, a young 17-year-old, that he was to encounter deeply impressive human beings, deeply at work, in trying to build for themselves lives 
that were defined only by their commitment to complete human freedom and human flourishing. Among these people were Isaac Tabata, and I'm going to say a, a word about Isaac Tabata. Uh, Isaac Tabata and his life partner, Jane Gould, Jane Gould's sister, Minnie Gould, and a number of other impor important people at the University of Cape Town. His education was essentially formed around the principles of non-racialism and non-collaboration, which he learned from the non-European unity, unity movement. He would come across, uh, when he got to the University of Cape Town, people in the non-European unity movement, largely outside of the university. They were of the university, but largely outside of it. And this complicated relationship that people had then with the academy is again a story that I think that we haven't uh, been able to make enough of. Outside the university, there were intellectual developments taking place which were a whole lot more impressive than inside the university itself. He found there <coughs> mentors, people who uh, were advancing this discussion about race in ways that were years, decades uh, ahead of their time. They were talking about this idea of race in ways in which the world only 20 years later was going to begin to uh, develop with the uh, uh, post-Marxist work that emerges in the social sciences in the late 1970s. People in the 1950s in Cape Town were already uh, thinking along these lines. Significantly, uh, of course, it, it is he uh, learning from these people who takes these ideas and develops them further. It required, however, uh, and in some ways, these very important people from whom he learned got stuck in the 1950s. Uh, but he had this benefit, this good fortune of being able to spend time in Germany and coming into contact with really important uh, <coughs> people in the German uh, left-wing movement. It also requires him to make contact uh, with colleagues on Robben Island. And it is at Robben Island uh, that he goes through what is probably the, the most crucial uh, period of education. Now, I'm not going to talk about this here, but it's again important for me to emphasize uh, to, to all of us how significant Robben Island is as a place of learning in the 1970s. Robben Island as a place of learning in the 1970s is way ahead of all the institutions in the country in the ways in which not only ideas are negotiated uh, and developed, but also in terms of just the imagination that was being evoked on the island about the future uh, of South Africa. Uh, I, I am personally a beneficiary uh, of this kind of renaissance that was taking place in the universities in the 1970s, but we didn't know how our colleagues on Robben Island had already begun to open up uh, uh, these, uh, these questions. And it is largely because of uh, the encounter that Neville has uh, with uh, Mr. Mandela. Uh, and I want to talk about this. Where he discovers the limitations of his own very European-centered education and where uh, Neville begins this enormously difficult process of unlearning and relearning alongside of, uh, of Mr. Mandela, how this forgotten figure of Africa needs to be reincorporated into what we understand about uh, our, our humanity. Um, I don't do much w with this in, in this paper at all. But, but I also need to, just to say in passing and very tangentially, and it really doesn't do the complexity of the experience just. Neville had a very complicated relationship with women. Uh, he uh, um, uh, uh, goes through, from the 1950s, older women, younger women, uh, women who uh, are, are very different to himself, he goes through you know, these in intense relationships. And the important thing to say 
is that he learns from all of them. I had this amazing experience of uh, standing in front of a gallery of his uh, lovers um, with his part partner, uh, Corin Piss, uh, and she took me through each one of them, uh, talking about the significance that these women uh, uh, had uh, on his life and in his life. And it's a very difficult thing to talk about it because he was almost Lenin-esque uh, about these uh, <coughs> about these relationships. But they pushed him intensely, and they pushed his his own understanding. And so he comes to a point where he is, in many ways, the foremost uh, defender of women's rights uh, as early as the the uh, the, the 1970s. He understands these questions of gender, way, and sexuality. We don't talk about that. He understands those questions way before a whole lot of us come to a, a, a full understanding of, of what these uh, issues are, 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 are all about. I just need to say that as Corin was showing me this gallery, he was standing alongside of her. <clears throat> and he said, and she said in front of him, uh, uh, thinking about all these women and the significance of, of, of these women, that he is the most honest man I know. Um, and it was a really hard thing for her to say, but it speaks to just what the quality of his relationships with uh, these, 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 these women uh, are. But it's important to say <coughs> uh, um, that he was more than the sum of these experiences uh, of which I speak. Um, he he recognised the debt that he owed all of these people uh, in his life. He never uh, neglected to pay tribute and to honour uh, these, these, these very important influences uh, he had in his life. But he knew that there was always something more to be learnt. He knew that there were futures and possibilities beyond his relationships with uh, the, these people. And so one sees uh, in the extensive body of his writing, and he wrote virtually every day of his life. It's extraordinary what uh, the size of this corpus is. And uh, Naim knows this a little bit because uh, Naim uh, has been able to go and, and look at this archive of Neville Alexander. There are things there that... that uh, haven't uh, become uh, become public, but in all of this writing, you can see this man wrestling, uh, this man engaging in his head with these deep, deep questions of what it means to go beyond the confines uh, of the past uh, uh, and the present, beyond these great people uh, uh, who uh, had had influenced him. His relationship, and I'd now like to talk about these relationships that he has with some of these formative people in his life. His life, <laughs> his relationships with these people were absolutely crucial in understanding uh, how he came to see his own life and how he came to this conscious objective of learning. And I want to emphasise that learning his way through the challenges uh, of, of the everyday. He was the complete opposite of a dogmatist. Very interestingly, these two foremost figures of modern South African history, Tabata and Mandela, one almost entirely unknown. Ask anybody who is an historian who Tabata is, and very few historians would be able to re remember Tabata. Uh, uh, and the other, elevated to almost saintly status, Mandela, were powerful touchstones, catalysts in his life. In his engagement with him, he comes to understand things about himself, but crucially also about human possibility in this most complex part of the globe. And we mustn't underestimate how complex South Africa is ontologically. And so he has in these two characters, Tabata and Mandela, images of a future uh, South Africa and future identities uh, for where South Africa uh, might go. 
and he learns deeply uh, from what they stand for and who they are. And I'd like to suggest that he comes away from these encounters with these two men. Uh, Tabata would have been slightly older than Mandela, and I'm absolutely sure that they knew who uh, it, it, each, it, each other were. Uh, <clears throat> but he comes away from uh, uh, his encounter with these two figures with this powerful, powerful understanding that neither modernity in its European glory nor Africa in its ancient wis wisdom is sufficient by themselves, by itself, as a lodestar for a life that is full, characterized by respect and capable of managing the unpredictable un unpredictability of the future. Out of, this, out of his encounter with these two people, he comes to learn, uh, as Professor Lionel Taver from the University of the Western Cape said recently <coughs> at the Neville Alexander Memorial Conference, that the idea of a general and formal ontology, such as that of Bishop Tutu's Rainbow Nation, with its fullness of tolerance, is deeply problematic in the way in which it forecloses on human possibility. So this comes to be the primary driver of every, everything in his life, the idea in a Nietzschean way. And if you pressed him, he will tell you how much Nietzsche uh, actually influenced him. That it is to the cause of nurturing human possibility that he should give himself and give his life. So here he's got Tabata and Mandela, uh, and he's saying that um, important as these two people were, and I try, I'm going to try to show, show, show that, uh, that there was more, that there was more beyond uh, what it is that they stood for. And so he comes to this realization in his life that there, that there is more, and that there, if there is more to be uncovering, he had to try and live it. He had to try and find a way in his life to begin to exemplify uh, what this more is, is all about. And it is out of this that I come to talk about him as an onto ontological experiment uh, in action, uh, in the way in which everything about him is, is, is defined by this urgency to be understanding what this more uh, is, is all about. Now, Tabata was crucial in shaping Alexander in two ways. It was firstly uh, Tabata's approach to formal politics particularly to the politics of non-racialism and modernity that struck a deep chord with Alexander. It was how Tabata just carried himself. So if you see these pictures of, of, of Tabata, uh, you'd begin to understand how a young boy from the country, such as Neville was, encountering this absolutely formidable man in the city uh, who bore himself with absolute confidence uh, and, and, and what a commanding presence this was uh, for people like Neville. Neville saw in Tabata this amazing capacity to be able to overcome all the baggage that colonialism and apartheid had imposed on Tabata. And what Tabata comes to exemplify for, for Neville, for Alexander, is the epitome of the kind of modern subject to which Alexander himself aspired. Not only was Tabata an intellectual, but he was a free intellectual. He had overcome and thrown aside the label of being black, never mind that hateful identity of being a Bantu. Uh, and so, on the one hand, Tabata claimed, uh, and this is what entranced people like Neville, Tabata claimed the whole world. He would say, the whole world is mine. The whole world was uh, his inheritance. All of it, the good and the bad, including, and this is an important thing to understand about Tabata. You saw this when Tabata's funeral took place uh, in the late 1980s, early 1990s including the Transkei with all of its riches of 
insight and wisdom which colonialism had sought to diminish. Tabata made all of that, all of that. Nietzsche, uh, 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 the depths of uh, these metaphors with which he had grown up as a young person, all of that uh, uh, was his. But Tabata also made clear, on the other hand, that he owed no loyalty to tribe, no loyalty to race, no loyalty to ethnicity. He was the product of Isikosa history, but he was not going to mem be a member of the Isikosa. He abjured race <coughs> and racial thinking. And so he was, in his day, uh, one of the country's foremost sociologists. Tabata not only wrote powerfully, but his text, Education as Barbarism, is to this day the key text on how civility and inferiority he works works. Uh, that text, Education as Barbarism, is a text which uh, our students uh, in schools of education uh, should all be reading. But Tabata also lived in his demeanor, in the way in which he carried his, uh, his, his uh, uh, sense of his identity, uh, this commitment to the world and what the world was uh, all about. He lived it through an intellectual curiosity that knew no bounds. He was deeply hopeful in uh, bringing Alexander to come to understand how dominant history worked uh, in seducing people uh, into narrow ideas about who they were. But he came to disappoint Alexander deeply. Alexander would never lose his respect for Debata, as he would later say also about his relationship with Mr. Mandela. But an experience he had with Debata, which led to his expulsion from the unity movement, made him realize how demanding this experiment was, which Debata embodied, and which he was seeking to uh, carry on, how difficult this experiment was. This experience came when he began to talk about began to talk to Tabata about moving the struggle in South Africa onto armed resistance. Tabata's uh, outrage response uh, brought Alexander to the realization that one had to be questioning oneself all the time. What Tabata did was to tell Ex Alexander that as a junior member of the unity movement, he had no business to be thinking about such important questions without the permission of the leadership. He said to Alexander, Neville knows where to come if, if he wants to have this discussion. Central in this response in the end for Alexander was not the question of armed struggle, but critically, his right to think. Implied in Tabata's reaction was that Alexander had not conducted himself properly. He did not know his place. Alexander's response to this was to break with Tabata and the NUM. He admired Tabata because he saw in him the vanquishing of a repressive history that had sought to totalize his identity. But he would not accept a Tabata who wanted him to know his place. To be subjected to that kind of subordination, a form of diminution, you boy, which Tabata appeared to expect, was not consistent with the logic of unconditional humanness which Tabata and his colleagues promoted. Where in what Tabata said to him was the invocation to throw over the shackles of history? I didn't have the, uh, personally the opportunity to talk with Alexander explicitly about what I refer to here as a failure of Tabata, of a failure of the exemplification of unconditional acceptance. I didn't have the opportunity to ask him what he thought was going on in this man's mind, because it wasn't race, class, and gender, the usual things uh, which uh, uh, are uh, implicit in much of our othering uh, and the marginalization of which we are used to. It was something else. Whatever it was, 
I suggest that it was an important uh, lesson which Neville was to take away from this, that the way in which people come to dis discriminate and to marginalize one are endless in their creativity. And this is a really important lesson, I think, for us to come to learn, and which is what this experiment of Neville's <coughs> was all about. Mandela was important for Alexander in a completely different way. Like many other products of the unity movement, Alexander was deeply skeptical about members of the African National Congress. People like him thought that the ANC and its leadership were African nationalists and even tribalists who had not taken the trouble to educate themselves properly <coughs> and so were susceptible to the worst forms of populism. People like Neville disliked what they described as the anti-intellectual approach with which the ANC engaged the legacy questions of race, class, and identity. Mandela uh, himself was very aware, uh, very aware of how these young men who came into prison in 1964, Neville was there a little bit before him, uh, how these young men ridiculed people such as himself. Uh, he would remark in Long Walk to Freedom, and this is a really interesting moment, and again, I didn't have the opportunity to, to talk to Neville about this. Uh, Mandela remarked that the only sour note in a memorial service organized on the island for Chief Albert Tatuli on his passing was, and you can almost hear Mandela speaking, was when Neville Alexander of the Unity Movement rose to speak. It was apparent that he had come not to praise the chief, but to bury him. And you can hear the cadence in Mr. Mandela's voice. And he carries on saying, without even perfunctory regrets at the man's passing, he's really angry. He accused Latuli of being a patsy of the white man. He goes on to say, this Alexander was wrong-headed. The relationship be between the two of them, one young and even arrogant at times, the other older and distinctly stubborn around questions about which he was unashamedly dogmatic was always going to be a difficult one. This young man, uh, fresh out of the university from Tübingen with a PhD with this older chief-like father. Alexander would have been extremely conscious of this father-son relationship in which he found himself. Uh, he would remember his own relationship, his own difficult relationship with his father. He would remember the recent experience uh, that he had with Tabata. And so he was not going to be told to mind his place again. But he did come to respect uh, Mr. Mandela deeply. This came about as a, res as a result of a decision on the island that the prisoners took to begin to understand their own history. And this is this moment of flourishing uh, of the intellectual movement uh, on, on, uh, on Robben Island. I've tried to write a, a little bit um, <coughs> about this. Neville himself talks about it, but I've tried to write a little bit about how Robben Island University, Robben Island University um, was at that time the foremost institution of learning uh, in the country. And what they did uh, on, on the island was to begin to teach themselves. And it takes a whole range of forms. Uh, but the one thing which they start doing is to start talking to themselves about their political histories. And of course, it very quickly falls to Walter Sisulu, to be, who was recognized as the major historian of the ANC to explain to everybody on the island uh, uh, what the a ANC uh, was all about. Alexander explained, and I'm quoting him now, that for the first time in many cases, we had the chance to reflect deeply and seriously about the nature and objectives of our struggle. Very few people in South Africa have had that opportunity. Close quotes. As the discussion became more heated, Sisulu began to defer to Mandela. The argument was put to Sisulu, that point two of the Freedom Charter, which described the South African nation as consisting of four national groups, namely Africans, whites, coloreds, and Indians, the four nations thesis was not acceptable. 
you can imagine uh, Zbolshi, young Neville Alexander, uh, saying that to uh, Mr. Mandela. It was at this point that this debate between Mr. Mandela and Alexander begins. The discussion proceeds relatively comfortable, comfortably until the racial question is raised. Mandela's position was that race was a straightforward issue of nature. Isn't it obvious? Can't you see? He would say. Alexander, drawing on his extensive uh, experience and education on this topic, held that the idea of race was a sociological construction. While Mandela, as Alexander s explained, and uh, uh, the many interviews uh, that ne Neville gives uh, uh, about uh, Mr. Mandela, uh, and we were going to talk again, because we had spoken about it, we were going to talk to him. I said to him, Neville, you must, you must really come back to this question of your relationship with, this, with, with Mr. Mandela. And you can see that slight giggle on his face, and he laughs, and he says, yes, yes, we, will. we never got to it. We died you know, shortly before we were able to have this conversation. But the critical thing about this is, is how forgiving he is of Mr. Mandela. And so he says of Mr. Mandela that Mr. Mandela was not an out and out biologist. And it looks like all the time when Mr. Mandela, in the way in which he speaks, is a biologist. Uh, uh, um, um, because he comes to the way in which he. Uh, explain the character of the South African people is invoke a very deep, almost naturalistic sense of what it means to be an African. Really interesting. You know, Africans are like this. Uh, and it's this encounter which, which then uh, brings uh, this uh, discussion to a boiling point where Neville uh, says, we came point blank, blank to this question uh, of a nation. I asked him uh, if we had a nation. I, I said to him, uh, we're building one. Mandela said to Alexander, we can stop this discussion immediately uh, because African people are a nation and the rest are minority nations. In response, Alexander said to him, now, uh, how do you describe a person classified coloured? Uh, and Mr. Mandela said, it's a union between uh, white and black. To this, uh, Alexander said, if you're going to persist with this view here, yeah, we're going to have to stop this discussion right now. Uh, unfortunately, uh, sorry, fortunately, the way in which this discussion happened was that they had to report to their principals all the time. This was a face-to-face a -face conversation uh, in the absence of anybody else. It was just the two of them. Uh, uh, and it's really interesting, you talk to people on the island, nobody knows the substance of this conversation other than these, 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 these two people. Many people knew that it was, it was going on because they reported back to their constitu constituencies. And their constituencies asked them, uh, gave them, if you like, mandates to pursue particular kinds of lines of, of, of questioning, of, of discussion. And they each went back to their constituencies. And the constituencies insisted that the conversation had to continue. And that decision to continue is a really important one because it comes to provide for a period of time on the island the most productive, non-partisan discussion that happens in the liberation movement. The conflicts between people in parties are more intense than they are between parties. Uh, there's an absolutely uh, close bond which people begin to develop uh, across uh, party lines. And it essentially emerged out of, as Neville says, the greatest lesson of all that they learned, that we were finally able to say to each other that on my assumptions, I have to end there. I understand that on your assumptions, you end somewhere else. And so the terms of the discussion uh, were, were uh, open and uh, uh, able to be negotiated. And as Neville says, that, that is the greatest lesson of all, I think. To be able to know that you need the kind of atmosphere in which you can talk about these differences in ways that don't, uh, uh, in, in these dogmatic uh, uh, positions. 
The lesson was of great importance for the non-communist uh, party socialists on the island. While they remained critical of African nationalism, they came to understand, and this was really crucial for Neville, they came to understand the importance of what they called the lived realities of living in a racialized space, of being African colored in South Africa, and the necessity to in develop an inclusive African view of the future of South Africa and the world. And this meant particularly for Neville, it was really important, it meant relearning all of these deep authoritative lessons that he had learned from the unity movement. Uh, he came to an understanding that what he was was the product of a largely Eurocentric uh, education. And it's out of this relationship that he has uh, with M Mr. Mandela that he begins to understand his Africanness, that he begins to uh, ap approach the, uh, the, the significance of what this cultural reality uh, of, 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 of Africa is, uh, is, 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 is all about. Powerfully, while they're on the island, uh, they, read big, they begin to read Basil Davison. And, and that's a really crucial text which he circulated uh, in and amongst uh, these colleagues. It hadn't even yet been prescribed in African history syllabuses in, in the universities. And they were able to lay their hands on these texts and were, and were, dis was, were discussing uh, these, these, these questions. And so as Alexander says, that there was a certain order of reality he recognized that we were not coming to terms with. And here's the breakthrough that he makes, and that he comes to realize that one of the ways of breaking through this uh, divide, which is uh, this boundary, which is traditional education, puts up is the fact that he cannot speak an African language. Uh, and so the language moment is a really powerful moment for him at that particular point. Because the unity movement out of which he had come uh, was propounding this gospel that everybody uh, was going to progress and benefit through the acquisition of English. Uh, and that English had to be uh, the medium through which uh, people's education uh, had to proceed. And this breaks this link that uh, Neville has with the unity movement even more decisively. And he says from that point that I'm no longer a member of this, uh, of this uh, organization. So he says that while he was unable to shift Mr. Mandela's sociological appreciation of the formation of races, Mandela had deeply influenced him. On questions of modernization and culture, he had a huge influence on me. I got a lot from him. So the language question, as a result, became deeply important in thinking about the questions of non, of nation building. In engaging with Mandela, uh, they were of the opinion that the social differences of the country uh, and the need to build a sense of social cohesion uh, lay not in the reification uh, of biology. And here he continues his criticism of Mandela, but in the capacity for people to understand the cultural differences and learning each other's languages would be the way in which these cultural differences could be access accessed. Now I come towards the, the end of uh, my talk here uh, and uh, uh, I begin to conclude. It's a rather long conclusion. Out of all of this, out of his engagement with Tabata and with Mandela, what did Alexander come to realize? He realized that in Tabata he found the dispassionate identity of the supremely rational modern subject. In Mandela, Alexander found a connectedness to people that profoundly affected him. Tabata towered over everybody with his intellect. Mandela exuded a sense of endless tolerance for difference. Alexander admired Tabata's intellect and Mandela's respect for others, but he realized that he had to go beyond the sense of all knowingness which Tabata projected. Tabata's modernity, when confronted, refused to acknowledge its own limitations. As a narrative, it was too disrespectful of the ordinary. Mandela's capacity for forgiveness, Alexander respected deeply, but he could never come to terms with the biologistic bio bio logic in which this respect was conjugated. It was too rigid. 
its ontological adherence to, a, to race, limited ideas of his own human poss possibility. So Tabata analyzed, Mandela felt, and Alexander understood. So what was at the heart of uh, his experiment? It was, if you like, a wide awakeness to the world. Alexander was acutely aware that every moment of his life was to be governed by thought. It made him acutely sensitive. Sensitive to nuance, sensitive to shade, sensitive to inflection, to tone, and particularly sensitive to exclusion. He was obsessively aware of injustice of any kind. It made him immeasurably thoughtful. He was a person who knew things. He knew, however, not just factually, but emotionally too. Knowing was a deep, cohering feature of who he was. He knew that there were implications if you knew something. He couldn't just say that he knew. He had to live what he knew. And so I've begun to say to myself that we had in him here somebody who had educated his instincts. And so he was unfailingly compassionate and kind. He was also completely selfless. It is, it is, and it is this, then, that comes to characterize his learnedness. He, as a result, eschewed all the special privileges and honors offered him, including the countless offers, offers of honorary degrees. Of course, he wasn't perfect, but for the most part, he had come to learn in a powerfully ecological way that he subsisted, that his life depended on the cardinal rule that he was always in a relationship with other people, and that those relationships depended for their success on his own care and thoughtfulness. He could not be without the generosity of others. Without them, his life would, could have gone in another direction. And so he came to embody that same generosity of which he had been a recipient in his own life as a scholar. He treated everybody in the circumference of his everyday world with the same undifferentiated respect. He sought to re recreate in all of his relationships that same sense of possibility that he had experienced his own, in his own development. You just look at these photographs, these images where he is with children. It's really quite extraordinary. He must have been immensely mindful of uh, uh, that age difference that had uh, uh, made this problem between himself uh, and, and, and Tabata. And so he was acutely aware of how he spoke to people. His discussions with people, anybody, always took place on the basis of absolute respect, as if everybody, they and he himself, could always be learning, learning to be better people. And so he knew how to listen. There was no conceit there. He did not, therefore, need any special singling out. This approach made it possible for him to become the important scholar that he was, one of the foremost intellectuals in the world on the question of privilege and oppression. But to be this kind of person, he had to be honest. He said what mattered to him. He could be searing in his analysis of an argument. He demanded of others the very best that was in them, but he was never unkind. Being like this he evoked fierce loyalty and admiration. It also got, in, got him into trouble. He had the ability, however, when he did get into these difficult situations, never to forgo the opportunity of learning. And I'd like to close now on this. An extraordinary episode in his life, and probably one that South African history will continue to struggle with, arises around the death of Steve Biko. Steve Biko had come to Cape Town specifically to speak with Neville about establishing a united front of organizations in exile. Uh, and the way in which Neville talks about this is immensely painful. And I'd like to quote him here. He said, and he's talking now. He stood, he's talking about Biko. He stood two meters away from my back door. Biko had come uh, with Peter Jones, this very Peter Jones uh, that gave the lecture last week. Uh, and they waited outside Neville's door to talk with him. Uh, um, and Neville says, 
There he was. He got out of, out of his car and he stood two meters away from my back door and I refused to meet him as much as I would have liked to, do, uh, to have done so. The story goes that Biko waited for three hours. Biko, as is now well known, was arrested while driving back to King Williamstown and was of course then killed by the security police. Neville explained, and I quote him, our group had decided that I should not meet Biko at that time. And I've always taken such disciplined decisions as binding. When I look back, I realize that this is perhaps the folly of being too principled. I was so hard, I was so principled. I'd not been mandated to see him and could not get a mandate in time. I've always been a disciplined per person, ever since I was a child. At times, perhaps too much so." Close quotes. Now, key about the story is the kind of person that he had become through his education, through this process uh, uh, of wrestling with himself. It had allowed him to give up any idea of self-importance. He was who he was because of others. This nurtured in him a capacity for self-reflection that was almost unlimited, to be self-critical, to ask how a situation could have been made better. It is this extraordinary quality that made his work in, in all its dimensions so utterly, utterly compelling. He embodied what it meant to be learned. And we in the university community are now deeply the poorer with him gone. Thank you. I, I must say that I have met uh, uh, Neville Alexander a second time uh, in this lecture. Uh, so many dimensions uh, of him uh, that I was not even aware <coughs> of. And thank you very much for that, uh, for helping us. Any comments? Questions? Maybe uh, on a very personal level, um, as a young Afrikaans woman, I encountered uh, the work of Neville Alexander through the Afrikaans. And uh, on a personal level, that has a pr profound influence also in my life. And listening to you tonight, uh, Professor Sodin, <coughs> giving a fascinating account of this very complex person, and in such a deeply engaging way, uh, was not for only for me an intellectual journey, but also a deeply personal journey. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. I, Naim? Yes. <laughs> Graham, you talk about um, the experience of Biko. <coughs> and you mentioned the group. Oh. Who was the group about Neville at the time? You know. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't just get away with mentioning a group. There are people to a group. <coughs> no. I would not. Look, I know. Less about this than Na Naeem does, um, and it's. It, I am copying out. I know. I, I I know a couple of people who were in that in rock. He was he was in uh, under house arrest at that time, and he was being watched. And 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 one of the issues that arose when when this uh, 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 visit by Biko uh, uh, took place was. An anxiety, maybe an over anxiety of putting people's lives in danger. Um, th th there's more <coughs> to this. I know there's more to it, but I'm not going to say. It, but I'd like um, uh, Naim to to perhaps uh, to just say what he does know, because it's it's really important. The thing is that when Neville came off the island, he 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 didn't stop 
being an activist. So even while he was under house arrest, he was beginning to cultivate uh, uh, these ideas which came to fulfillment uh, in One Azania, One Nation. Uh, by the way, um, those of you who know this particular text here, um, I just need to say this, that um, as a result of this conversation that began on the island uh, um, uh, between Neville and Mr. Mandela, uh, Neville was mandated by the liberation movement to rewrite the history of South Africa. Uh, it's a really important thing for people to know. Um, uh, and it wasn't just from his own party, it was from the, the movement. The movement said, it's your task here now to rewrite the story of, of what our lives are, 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 are all about. And he did make a start, but he, he never actually got on, on to do it. One Azania, One Nation is, is a version of that, if you like. But it's not this, 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 this task that he had, uh, that he had been given. Um, uh, uh, and, and let me just say this, there's a really interesting corpus of literature around uh, Robben Island. And in, and in this corpus of literature, I forget who the prisoner is, the prisoner is very angry with Neville and says to, says to Neville that you undertook to do this and you haven't done it. Uh, um, uh, you know, and it's, and it's, um, it's, really, it's really interesting how deep these bonds of trust were between people you know, at that particular time. Uh, I've, I've shifted the locus of the question away from what you're asking, but uh, you know. I, 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 think, found I think it's, I sorry, Tim, just, to, just to add to that, you know, that, that period, 1997, was absolutely critical. It was just a year after 1976. 77. 77. 77. Yeah, did, what did I say? 97? Seven. <laughs> I meant 77. <coughs> it was just a year after 1976, <coughs> the year of fire and the year of ash, <coughs> what Baruch Hassan calls that. And Neville um, was, he, he was under house arrest and he was, I think two two years um, into into his stay off the island, the people and th this has been published already. The people who were part of that particular group, and it's important to know because these were people who carried principal ideas of unification later on in the national forum. Um, people people who were associated with Neville at the time were, among others, Fikir Evans. He was part of that central group of people who mandated Neville not, not to speak to Stephen. And this is quite important because it wasn't a personal decision on his part at all. Um, it was a collective decision. That's what I want to say. Yeah, I, I wanted to, to link with that a little bit because um, I just wanted to, to know whether you, you think this particular incident of um, uh, Neville sticking to a mandate uh, and doing it so, um, so, so, so dogmatically, if you like. And if you contrast that mm -hmm. with Mandela starting to negotiate with his uh, uh, imprisoners without a mandate, mm -hmm. whether this is actually a, an illustration of the difference between the mm. two of them? Mm -hmm. No, no, it is. And of course, Mr. Mandela gets into deep trouble <laughs> on the island when he begins that proposal. Yeah. Uh, as, as early as the, uh, as the, as, 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 as the early 1980s. Uh, and it's what causes this lifelong rift between Mr. Mandela and, and uh, 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 Mr. Senior uh, Mbeki. Um, Govan. Govan. Okay. All right. It, it looks like... Comments, colleagues. Comments. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, I just want to know what, what was the relationship between uh, Neville and uh, the other radicals in the uh, ANC? Because I, I understand that the ANC was also divided. It featured two factions. Mm. It was a, f a f faction which was... Uh, led by the late uh, Gavin Kudegi 
pappar och bröt fem kilo så i fyrt inkluderat det är delayed här i Guala. Ja. Men de ska ju ha en man till att bli president. Och så är det liberation movement where and 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 then there were others who you know as they as they pretend like in prison. Yeah. Yeah, those radicals in the in the in the ANC. So yeah. What was the, the relationship between uh, him and uh, that group? Well, uh, I, mean, I don't know enough about this, and I never had the opportunity to talk to Neville about it. But the, the, the I think the Mbeki Gwala faction begins to strengthen really only after Neville begins to leave the, the island. But the key thing, I think, to talk about in relation to all of this is this difference between uh, uh, the Stalinists and uh, uh, and uh, the other socialists um, on, 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 uh, on the island and in the movement as a whole. So there's immense suspicion of, 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 of the South African Communist Party. Uh, 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 and uh, that particular divide uh, is one which, which I think was an even more even more difficult one. Um, um, you you had here, uh, uh, if you like, even at that particular point, uh, these very different ideas about what the socialist future was 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 all about. Uh, and I suppose the comment you made earlier about uh, Palo Jordan. Uh, making that uh, remark about waiting for October yeah. um, speaks to that uh, that those tensions. Uh, so maybe those tensions are not completely dead. No, no, uh, they're still very <laughs> much alive <laughs> to yeah. this day. Yeah. yeah. Can I just say on that point, <coughs> it's important to remember that Neville was always close to people who were not necessarily part of his political organization. Um, I remember going with him to visit Zef Motopeng from the PAC shortly after he was released from prison and before he died. Uh, when Kathrada was released, we went to Lenz together to do that. Laiban Mabasa, who was the <coughs> other respondent to Paolo Jordan's um, I thought uh, very problematic uh, talk was a close confidant of Steve Beaker and a few years after Steve Beaker's death Neville worked very closely with the Azanian People's Organization and Laiban was the first president to set up the National Forum so I think these things are very important to remember and tells you a lot about Neville the man. So he wasn't dogmatic in that sense. He was always attacked from a very dogmatic point of view, primarily from the Communist Party. I mean, their mouthpiece um, uh, constantly uh, referred to Neville, and Neville responded to this as well. Uh, so I think that story must be told. I, I also think that there's a whole period of his uh, recent life, uh, post-1994, uh, that you know, we need to speak about as well. Uh, the praxis, the practical work, uh, not just uh, academic work, uh, grassroots work. And that's why the comment by Paolo Giordani is so unkind. Because if there ever was a person who went house to house, or heispesuk, as we called it, who was with workers in trade unions, mm -hmm. I mean, he addressed trade union conferences that we invited him to, uh, he was not uh, a distant uh, uh, academic, not involved in day-to-day -day struggle, mm -hmm. even when that struggle sometimes was tedious sitting in endless meetings with many of us, uh, and it didn't advance one's career. Um, I think those things are very important, and I hope that story and that side 
of Neville is also told. No, 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 I completely agree. No. <coughs> I mean, to his last days of his life, he, uh, he, he, if a pamphlet needed to be distributed, he was, he was on the ready. Mm. He uh, uh, had absolutely no anxieties about his status. If there was work that needed to be done, he did it. Yeah. Organic intellectual. Yes. Okay. You seem uh, depleted in terms of questions. I'm going to ask my colleague, uh, Professor Potsma, to, to take charge of the, the, <coughs> the next two or uh, three uh, items in the agenda. And if I disappear, uh, please pardon me, uh, because I have to, to rush to Pretoria. Thank you. Thank you very mm, much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just uh, <coughs> um, calling on the next person, um, um, uh, Im Ali. Um, to um, talk to us about the special issue um, on Neville, Neville Alexander of education has changed that, that appeared recently. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, this event tonight started with the idea that we should launch uh, the special issue of education has changed and then uh, the Dean uh, suggested, um, as Deans do, with a commanding voice but this is becoming a first of, of a series of, of lectures um, commemorating Neville Alexander. Um, I wanted to use this occasion to pay homage to um, the, the previous editor of Education <coughs> Terms, L.B. Hennen, who couldn't be here tonight. And I wanted to use the occasion to present her with, with a, um, a token of, of appreciation of what she founded and what she did um, over many years. Um, it was also her vision um, to, um, to have a special issue on Neville Alexander um, very early on um, last year, uh, towards the end of last year, and, and she approached um, um, uh, Naim to put the special issue together. With that, um, it wasn't just a special issue, I think it was also um, launching education has changed into, um, into a new kind of mode um, which we want to carry forward um, with the journal. Um, and it is, um, it's, it's kind of a, a capturing a dream <coughs> that got sidelined, I think, in the educational um, um, uh, discourse in South Africa, not only in education but in society um, in general. Um, a dream that Neville Alexander uh, pre presented, and we want to capture something of that and, and to continue um, realizing some of the, the issues that, that he stood for. So uh, Naim will say something about the special issue, and after him, um, Salim um, will say something about the future um, of this commemorative uh, series of lectures. <clears throat> um, I want to I want to talk about three important landmarks landmark stories leading up to um, the special issue um, they they're very much tied up with my own life and the lives of people around me <coughs> and I'm again sad that that Tinico um, has left because he's part of that story. In 1982, I was part of a a reading group. We called it uh, a reading group. In actual fact, it was a Marxist cell in Cape Town. <coughs> this cell involved Neville Alexander. Frank van der Horst, 
Audrey Mayer, Peter Mayer, Pumezo Lupuwana, and Derek Naidu. Derek Naidu's um, daughter just left. Um, her name is Leanne. In 1982, this group was duplicated in many different forms with other people as well, around Cape Town and in Johannesburg, in Durban, and in the Eastern Cape. <clears throat> we wrote a document which was titled, Let Us Build the United Front, and it was signed under the nom de plume, Stierman. <laughs> Neville was the lead author. The document was passed around um, with quite a few people reading it and adding their bits. And eventually it landed up um, as a document that was published in Race and Class. <clears throat> that was a little bit later than 1982. I think it was in 84 that it was actually published. <clears throat> and three people um, co-authored this document. <clears throat> I say three people because these were the names that we decided um, should be the co-authors in the public domain. You must remember we were living in a military state mm -hmm. at the time. And these three people were Neville, Jean Pease, and me. <clears throat> now, this is an important story for me to tell you because it was also in 1982 that I was appointed by Neville to become the first editor of a publication called Freya Zanya. <clears throat> now, this was in the context of um, trying to build up an alternative voice, both theoretically and politically, to the voices that were established voices, in the left, that is, voices among which were um, Labour Bulletin, Work in Progress. These were left-wing voices. But eventually, these, organized, these voices became aligned, more or less, to what we call the Congress Alliance. We set up Free Azania to be a counter and to add new left voices to the existing array of voices. This was my baptism into the wonder and the anguish of being an editor. I was 23 years old, and I can quite frankly tell you now that if I were Neville, and Neville was 46 when he appointed me, <clears throat> I would not appoint a nobly, <laughs> inexperienced 23-year-old to head up a journal. With hindsight, 31 years down the road, I am still an editor. I still do journals. And had it not been for that initial contact through Psyched Trust, and then eventually <coughs> being appointed by the group and Neville particularly to head up this journal as a left-wing voice, I don't think I would have been an editor today. So I suppose my one comfort at the time, at 23 years old, um, was that Neville was always in the background and we could always rely on his advice and strategy. So 31 years later, I'm, in st I'm still an editor. And to those of us who are thinking of becoming editors as a career or as a job, or already are editors, my big piece of advice is this. Over these years, I've learned one thing about being an editor, and that is your job is to make others look good. You might think that the journal is in your name and you're the big editor, but at the end of it all, your job as an editor is to make others look good, not you. And that was the key thing to learn in 1982. And Neville was instrumental in this. I mean, he, he 
really gave people like me the platform mm. to explore and to run with ideas. <coughs> and Crane speaks about you know, the fact that he had a difficult relationship with Tabata. I didn't have a difficult relationship with Neville, but I disagreed with him on many, many issues, and he entertained that disagreement. <coughs> then in 2007, uh, six years ago, I met um, Tiniko Maluleke, your Deputy Vice-Chancellor, who was then the Executive Director of Research at UNISA. <coughs> I, wanted, I approached him to talk about three projects that I had in mind. The one was to do a thesis on Neville Alexander. The second was to develop the framework for a book to be published on Neville Alexander by UNISA Press. And the third project was to develop a framework with Tineco for a documentary on Neville Alexander. <clears throat> he um, very kindly listened to me. And um, as executive uh, director of research, he advised me to consult one of his professors, which I did. I completed one and a half of those projects <coughs> after six years. I completed a, a thesis on Neville, and I completed Education as Change. It's a half a book, if you like. But it was through Tinyiko's office that I, van that I eventually landed up as a consulting editor at UNISA Press. He gave me access to people who supervised me eventually, and who also introduced me to editing at UNISA Press. And then in October 2012, I met Albie Henny, <coughs> who invited me to be the guest editor of a special issue on Neville Alexander. This special issue, and um, I brought copies for you to buy, the 85 rand each. This special issue on, on Neville is the product of a joint collaboration <coughs> between Albie me, the writers, and the reviewers, and quite a few others who have participated in the construction of the story around his writings. I suppose Karen Press, who is um, who's Neville's partner, um, pointed out that, you know, Naim, this is the first real critical commentary on Neville's work. Well, I don't know about that, but I can see where she's going to. And this is exactly what Neville would have wanted, a critical engagement with his thought, with his political strategy, with his work. And I think this is what we're trying to do as well now. Through symposia, um, through debates, through having conferences on Neville, it's absolutely vital that we take forward the idea that you have to challenge him, because this is what he wanted. He desired and needed to be challenged, like he challenged Tabata, like he challenged Mandela, and like he challenged me in many different ways. You know, throughout my 30 odd years of editing, very little and yet very much has changed <coughs> in the world of editing. As editors, we are required to understand the field in which the writer works and the writer writes. We have to understand how ideology works and we've got to place ourselves in the writer's shoes. And this is often very, very difficult. To be able to place ourselves 
in the shoes of another person. I think one of the seminal things I learned in the 1980s through my experience with Neville is his insistence. Now, M, if you want to be an editor, don't think about writing for yourself. Think about providing a framework for others to write. And this is absolutely critical. <coughs> With journals, our biggest challenge, and yeah, I was hoping that Tiniko, and I'm pleased that Crane is here. This is now where I'm going to get into trouble with these bosses. <laughs> with journals, our biggest challenge as editors is not to succumb to the increasing power of numbers, but to stick, and I know this is going to be difficult, to the wonder of words. It is our duty to challenge the seduction of managerialism and return to the spirit of academic collegiality. Our universities are being run by numbers. They are not being run by thoughts and ideas and words anymore. Numbers are beginning to dictate how our universities are run. We must insist as editors on the best that our academics can produce. We have one deputy vice chancellor now here with us. To both Crane and I hope Tineko will get to hear these thoughts as well. I'd like to make the following <coughs> appeals. There are three appeals. I'd like for us as the academy to acknowledge that knowledge is produced inside and outside the academy, academy, academy. And appropriate strategies need to be pursued to reflect, to reflect on, to capture and to analyze both inside the academy and outside the academy. academy. We have to stop using the 120,000 rand that each article generates when and if published in an accredited journal as institutional subsidies, as a blunt instrument to bully our academics into publishing. This is not why they should be publishing. They should be publishing because we need to discover and we need to experiment in the academy. And they have to reflect this experimentation and discovery. I have had many conversations with editors and writers. And these conversations have disappointed me tremendously. <clears throat> And the one reason why they have disappointed me is because people are chasing the money. The more articles you have in a journal, if it's accredited, the more bucks you get. And this is just not, this is not right. And I think we need to reflect very seriously about having what essentially was a reward for writing turned into a motivation for writing. <coughs> I mean, I, I've been editing quite a few journals now over the past number of years at Unisa Press. And I can tell you now, and these are my critical comments, I would not publish half of these articles. Yes, they've been peer reviewed. Yes, they've been through the process. But quite frankly, I can see that the money is being chased here. So I'm going to appeal to us to not use that 120,000 rand per article as a blunt instrument to bully our academics into publishing. And just as a last point in this regard, I'd like to say that academic lit literacy 
is not an entry condition, but an objective of university study. And often people, and people have been using this as an entry point. You've got to be academically literate. It's a lot of bollocks. You become academically literate through university study. The last point I'd like to um, make as far as my appeals go to the bosses of universities, we need far more open debate and discussion about the best means to disseminate discovery and experimentation. Commercial publishers have been very important in the country and are very important in our country. And they provide a service. But I think that we need to have far more discussion about open access, about how best to get published, what are the benefits, what are the cons. And I think that these issues need to be taken up by our editors in both accredited and non-accredited journals. I'd like to end by saying a few words about the special issue. I absolutely loved doing special issue on Neville Alexander. He was a person close to my heart, and he was an intellectual giant in my life. His imagination influenced large parts of my adult life, <coughs> and I'm deeply grateful <coughs> for the role he's played. There was sadness in doing it, but there was also energy and creativity. There was disappointment at the fact that a few invited writers could not meet my punishing deadlines and give us, the readers, an opportunity to think through their thoughts on the man. I invited 15 people and eight eventually stayed the course. Those who graciously accepted my bullying to deliver on time did so admirably. My last remark is to say that Elizabeth Hennig's courage, Elizabeth Hennig's courage and tenacity <coughs> were in large part instrumental in making this editing project a success. I'd like to thank her and the incumbent editor Dirk Postma for the support this year. I don't think without, you know, without the support of both Dirk and, and Albi, it would be extremely difficult, it would have been extremely difficult to um, get a journal together from beginning to end in eight months. Then of course I'd like to thank Andrew, who is the managing editor of UNISA Press Journals and who um, came tonight because he endorsed the project from the very beginning. And without that kind of endorsement, I would not have been able to rush through the processes of reviews and printing. Ordinarily, a journal from conception to end takes up to a year and a half. We did it in eight months, and that was quite an achievement, and largely due to the endorsements from Dirk, Albi, and Andrew. One last remark I'd like to make, and that is, and I'm going to leave you with this, you know, the, the, there's a saying that you've got to own your writing. Over these many, many years, one of the things that I've learned through Neville, and one of the things I try to implement in my editorship of journals, whether it's copy editing, guest editing, or being the journal editor, is that you, you mustn't only just own the journal, you've got to own up to what you say in that journal. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, I'll be very brief.
brief. Can I stand here? Yes. Yeah, sure. I have the ability to project my voice. Um, I must confess, I was one of the seven that refused to be bullied by Nayib. <laughs> but it was a very awkward time, and uh, a man needs to sleep. Anyway, um, it's been a long evening. I just want to say that Neville was here in this very chambers, actually. It might have even been his last public uh, meeting address before going to Germany when he became ill. He also launched CERT. Um, and I must say that uh, the Dean, Professor Gravit, would know that when she approached me about getting Neville to, I think, give a talk at a graduation ceremony or something like that, I told her, you're wasting your time. <laughs> We've tried this over the years from very many institutions. Uh, that's exactly what I said, but I will try. Um, and I did, and in fact, I was pleasantly surprised that uh, Neville agreed uh, to pass on his CV because that was the request, and I <laughs> kind of sheepishly asked. And it's something that uh, Crane mentioned to me when I met him, when uh, um, even before we realized that Neville was very ill, or would become very ill. I bumped into Crane at the airport. <clears throat> and Crane said that, you know, Neville is really coming to terms with issues of mortality and uh, is more amenable to doing things he would refuse to <laughs> in the past. Um, of course, he was adamant about a few things, like uh, refusing honorary doctorates. He thought that was demeaning, uh, very uh, and he would have done that as well if it was offered to him, but we came to some kind of compromise. Uh, you know, one can't really capture the, the depth and breadth of Neville's contribution and to all our developments um, in so many different ways. But we can attempt to use his praxis, his example, his critical thinking, his rich history, it wasn't just about him, it was about the people around him, men and women, uh, organizations and cultural associations. Uh, he loved uh, uh, choirs, for example, his own background uh, with the church. All of this made Neville uh, an exceptional human being, but he was a product of the society he came from, and that is uh, an optimistic thing. I refuse to believe that he was the last revolutionary, <laughs> as some have called him. I mean, I think Neville would disagree with this as well. So I think that it's really important, and I think it's uh, wonderful that uh, Dirk has taken this upon himself, that the dean has agreed to this, that Naim edited uh, a <coughs> book uh, if he didn't give those punishing schedules, the book would not have been produced in time. Uh, and that most importantly, Crane continues to talk about, in various fora, uh, about the things that we need to hear, we need to debate, we need to discuss. We can never do justice to this in a once-off way, at one forum. Um, and because it's not just about Neville's writings, it's about our society. And it's in flux, it's dynamic, it's constant. Uh, but Neville does provide us with a platform to explore these things urgently. So uh, every year with the faculty, the Center uh, for Education Rights and Transformation, as well as people around the country and really around the world, because one of the things about Neville is that he was a genuine internationalist. He wasn't a narrow nationalists. Uh, he, he believed in building a nation in South Africa, but not in a parochial way at all. He had his eyes on developments uh, against injustice. He was fond of quoting Bertolt Brecht uh, that uh, injustice uh, is everywhere, but so is the struggle against uh, injustice. So something to that effect, it was a bit more lyrical, I forget the exact words. 
But I think in the coming years, uh, you know, ne specifically Neville's contribution uh, to education, uh, whether it was issues of multilingualism, um, his involvement uh, on the, in the University of Robben Island, uh, the period of the Sackett Trust, the National Education Initially Crisis Committee and then Coordinating Committee, uh, the Committee of 81 that people from the Cape are familiar with, these are things people don't know about. And yet, the contributions of these struggles, even going back, I got Neville's with Karen, we went through. By the way, it's not called the Neville Alexander Archives. It's named after a partner of Neville's who died in Germany. Um, and that's an interesting story in itself, which was told to me by Karen as well. But from the 50s, really, the first written text I came across that Neville wrote uh, in the student, um, in the Cape Peninsula Students' Union, uh, when he must have been really, really young, perhaps as young as Naim was when he was the editor of Priyazania, uh, still is so pertinent and still so relevant, despite the many changes. The fundamental issues that Neville talks about remain important and uh, it must be discussed <laughs> by us. Neville's involvement in the 80s, the students of Young Azania, the school boycotts, and particularly in the post-apartheid uh, uh, era, post-1994. There are many aspects of Neville's, uh, people know about uh, the importance of language to education, but he also talked about how to break spatial apartheid. Not many people talk about the work um, with urban planners, uh, Smith and Hennessy, for example, taking the ghetto out of education and education out of the ghetto. It's very important and it's something that Neville always was very keen to explore. One of the students have come, has come <coughs> to me and wants to do his PhD on this issue. Uh, so there are many people thinking about that. The importance of anti-racism of as Crane talked about, undermining racial thinking and ethnic consciousness, very dear to Neville's heart. Uh, there are many other issues around reading clubs um, and the bridging uh, programs between school and university that Neville was involved with, with Kanya College, but also his seminal work on, on African history, which was read by tens of thousands of people. Every issue was banned was contained in the new nation at one point, that John Samuels, uh, who was the national director of the Sacred Trust, is planning to put together with Karen. There might be certain complications, but we're attempting to do that. So every year we want to bring together uh, and be as inclusive as possible, uh, and possibly if funds allow, uh, bring people from other provinces and perhaps with the support of different agencies and I think we need to approach the Germans uh, get people from overseas who can allow us to explore this thinking uh, so we'll set up a, a, a committee made up of people from the faculty CERT and perhaps other people um, and we'll invite in an inclusive way, people who want to explore these ideas uh, around the country and make the event uh, an event that we can all look forward to and contribute to. Uh, I think that will be important and it's a real honor uh, for us to drive the process, but we can't do it on our own and we hope that uh, many of you <coughs> will join us in ensuring that that event becomes something that uh, something to look uh, forward.